Welcome to Experimental, the science show where people sniff each other and eat worms. Later on, we'll be entertaining in the test department. Using radio transmitters to track this little chap and finding out how to survive in the wilderness with the aid of an aluminium can and some chocolate. But first, let's bend it with Beckham. Experimental wanted to know how top footballers managed to bend the ball so much that when they kick it, the similarly overpaid goalkeeper at the other end can't get his hands to it. Unfortunately, it costs a lot to film the likes of David Beckham, so we filmed this lot from Northern Ireland, Antrim versus Armagh, in the hope that one of their players would bend the ball really, really well. And then we could ask him. We waited and waited. Nice ball! And after 90 minutes, nothing remotely Beckham-like had happened much to the disappointment of both us and the crowd. So we went off to Belfast Queen's University to meet Dr Cathy Craig, who spent years studying not only why Beckham shots bend, but why goalkeepers can't get their hands on his balls. It might not sound like the sort of academic research a great brain should be engaged in, but ball spinning is big business. Spin is really something that is quite difficult to, to judge and if you look at lots of sports nowadays, people do use spin to their competitive advantage in cricket, in baseball, tennis, all these sports. And like sports manufacturing companies now specifically develop shoes that allow you to put more initial spin on the ball at contact, which essentially will mean the ball will bend more in the air. Being able to spin a football really well means that you can earn a lot of money. So much that Cathy couldn't afford a Beckham type for her experiment, so she settled on the next best thing, an automatic ball bender. It does everything those expensive silver-clad feet can do, and more. So spinning balls essentially create something called the Magnus effect or the Magnus force, which disrupts the airflow around the ball. So imagine that the ball is given side spin on this hit on this side of the ball will cause it to rotate in that clockwise, counterclockwise direction like this. So what happens is the ball heading in this direction, the air will flow faster around this side than this side, pushing the ball back in towards the goal. This spinning ball creates a pressure differential. The pressure building on one side and reducing on the other. As a result, the ball bends as it heads towards the goal. All very clever, but it still doesn't explain why the bloke with the gloves can't get his hands to it. To answer that question, Cathy teamed up with the University of the Mediterranean to create a virtual bending machine capable of bending balls any which way she fancied. All she needed now was a goalkeeper. Sadly, the only thing he has to do is say whether he thinks the ball will go into the goal or not. So don't expect any entertaining dives into the lab wall. Bon. Cool. This experiment was essentially to test the effects of spin and human behaviour. So what are the variables, optic variables, or what do the eyes pick up in terms of information when the ball has spin on it? After a few hundred spinning balls, there was no doubt about it. Get the ball to bend like this, and the keeper just can't work out where it's going. We set up like a virtual reality environment where we positioned the ball, and then we simulated where the ball would arrive and put spin in the ball, no spin in the ball, and we asked people to make judgments about the future arrival place of the ball. Would it be a goal? Would it not be a goal? So we set up an experiment where balls had trajectories with spin and without spin. Counterclockwise spin and clockwise spin were the two spin variables, and then there was no spin condition. So we had four conditions where the ball arrived outside the goal and four where the ball arrived inside the goal. Sometimes it was hard to, to see, the guess, where the ball, if it was going out or not. Uh, it's, it was a bit different than 
actual real life actually working, but uh, it was very close to it, so it was useful and it was it was cool technology. Like <laughs> she's not one hundred percent sure yet, but Kathy speculates the reason might be this: a monkey. Like ours, its brain is good at working out the trajectories that recur naturally in nature, like the path of this falling nut. But unfortunately for it, and goalkeepers, the strange parabolic trajectory of a spinning football simply does not occur in nature. So its brains, and those of its distant cousins like us, are simply not designed to work out where the spinning ball is going to go. So, in the unlikely event that this county antrum goalie is ever confronted by a really good spinning ball, the long-suffering home crowd will just have to accept that he never had a chance. Hello! In a moment, we're off to Montreal to meet a man who studies the smell of women's armpits. But first, let's head to the test department for a hot date. Billy Bunter is in a bit of a tizzy. He was so busy with his cold fusion experiments that he totally forgot he'd invited his lady friend over for drinks and nibbles. Hence the panic cleaning, sprucing up, and the application of cheesy music. Phew, all we need now is something nice to drink. A quick chill in this handy freezer. Let's just hope beer is her thing, Billy. Still, at least they'll be cold. A little while later and Billy is giving it his all. But it seems she doesn't want to do any nibbling. Her lips fancy something much cooler. Luckily, Billy is prepared. Cold beer might not be a cocktail, but at least it can be stirred. Which is when disaster strikes. Within seconds, the beer turns to ice. What's happening? is a phenomenon known as supercooling. Under pressure, like in a beer bottle, the freezing point of water drops below zero degrees Celsius. So when Billy pulled it from the freezer, it was still liquid. When he opened the top, the pressure inside the beer bottle dropped. But the beer remained liquid in what physicists call a supercooled state. Billy's big mistake was to stir it. As soon as the stick went in, it provided a point for the ice crystals to form, and within seconds, the whole bottle is frozen. Sadly for Billy, the test department is a very hot place, and the ice soon melts. Still to come on Mad Labs... Tally -ho! Why birds don't fall off trees when they sleep? The future of food. Don't eat the wing. You hold the wing, make sure that the abdomen kind of pops up between your fingers, and you just pop the whole thing in your mouth. And the randiest dormouse in the world. But before that, it's armpit time. Thank goodness we humans are not like dogs. Unlike them, we only seem to use two and a bit of our major senses. Sight. Tom. Sound. Tom. Hi. Hi. And a bit of touch. See you. The only thing we don't do is this sniff. Or mark our territory with smell. Or do we? Well, according to this chap, Dr. Johan Lundström, a cognitive neuropsychologist from McGill University in Montreal, we do use pheromones. We know that most species we have looked at, they do use pheromones in a way of communicating. So I think it will be highly unlikely if we humans also do not use pheromones. You'll find his lab's a bit of a whiffy place to hang out, because each of these tubes is filled with the body odour of one of his subjects. Go again. Pen number one. His theory is that we retain the ability to identify members of our family and close friends by their body odour, just like dogs do, even if we don't know it. To prove it, he's asked various people to wear cotton pads under their arms. And it's those scented samples that make their way to his labs. How are you? Then a brave volunteer is asked to sniff a number of samples. Some close family and friends, some the pong of strangers. The results are remarkable. Yeah, let's see this one. Okay. 
When it comes to picking out your friend, you had nine out of nine correct. When it comes to picking out your sister, it was nine out of nine. Nine out of nine. And then picking out yourself, you were slightly worse, but still very good. Eight out of nine times to pick the right body order coming from yourself. When subjects were put into a scanner and fed with the whiff of their loved ones, a specific part of the brain lit up. Usually, when we smell something, parts of our primitive brain are activated. The primitive brain is the oldest part, and we share it with all vertebrates, like frogs. Normally, it's this part of the brain that governs smell and emotion, which explains why the whiff of food instantly produces the desire to eat. The scent of loved ones, however, bypasses all this and is processed by higher parts of the brain, such as the neocortex that deal with thinking and attention. So why, if smell is so important, do we spend so much time trying to disguise it? It's a very interesting question uh, whether our use of, of deodorants and perfume actually mask these odors and are taking away a lot of information that we could actually benefit from. But I still would not recommend anyone to stop using deodorants because not using deodorants and having a foul body odor is by far more negative than not uh, submitting some type of message if you want to pick out a super partner. And that begs another question. Super partnered dogs don't use deodorant, and their sense of smell is said to be up to 10,000 times more developed than ours. So why then do they spend most of their time with their nose buried in each other's bottoms? Hello. In a moment, we'll be opening the experimental restaurant in downtown Montreal and going camping with the test department. But first, let's meet Brian. Brian is an ornithologist with a lifelong ambition. He wants to observe a bird falling off a perch when it falls asleep. By night, he watches jays. And by day, he watches owls. But he's never seen so much as a wobble. And this is scarcely odd, because millions of years of evolution have made sure that perching birds do not fall out of trees whilst asleep. It's all down to what's called the flexor tendon, a neat bit of stringy stuff that runs from the back of the leg, over the knee and down under the ankle to above the toes. When a bird goes to sleep, it squats down. The string tightens and pulls their claws together around the twig. The more relaxed they get up top, the tighter the claws become down below. Indeed, some claim birds have even been found dead, still attached to a twig. So, Brian, I'm afraid you're wasting your time. Don't try this at home! Before we eat some worms, Let's head to the test department for a game of football. Some are in the test department and our demonstrators have football fever. Ah, lab coats for goalposts. The exquisite precision of a free kick. But of course, there's always someone determined to spoil the party. Still, after some deliberation, the demonstrators hit on an ingenious solution to their problem. It's called a ladder, a simple device that can get anyone from the ground to a roof in seconds. However, this being the test department, simplicity is not the name of the game. Our demonstrators aren't stupid enough to go up a ladder without fully analysing their physical limitations in order to find out the limits of the safety envelope. Still, they need not have bothered with a blackboard. What they needed was this, part of Lawrence Cliff's 287-page seminal work on ladder safety. Deep within its geometry are contained these pearls of wisdom. A ladder should be placed so that the base is one metre out per four metres up. It can be made slightly more safe by employing a footer. But if they employed a classical one foot on the ground, one arm on the ladder technique, useful if you want to eat a sandwich, they'll actually make things more dangerous. This unsteadies the ladder and makes it more likely to flip. According to Clift, 
the best way to foot a ladder is this. Place both feet on the bottom rung as far apart as the ladder will allow and then remain as still as possible. Do this and you can safely get your ball back. Time and time again. Still to come on Mad Labs, a dormouse hunt in the south of England. But only if you can stomach this next item. Here's a question. What's a more environmentally sustainable form of protein? This or this? Well, the answer, according to nutrition expert Patrick Owen of McGill University, is the bamboo worm. <gasps> Extremely high nutritive value, very high in protein, about 53% protein. Compare that to 20% beef. Has almost all the vitamins and minerals that you need. Uh, it's, it really is such a really nutri nutritious food. Half the world has no problem with eating things like bamboo worms or insects like crickets. But in the West, well, the thought of eating a bug is enough to reintroduce yourself to your last meal pretty fast. And that's why Experimental has travelled to Montreal. Now it's time for dessert. We want to see if we can help Patrick persuade a bunch of lily-livered Canadians to tuck into a three-course insect, worm and bug meal. I've travelled in parts of the world, Papua New Guinea, some parts of Africa, they just relish eating insects. For them, it's a delicacy. Welcome. Nice to meet you. So let's welcome our guests to the experimental one-night-only restaurant where all the ingredients are guaranteed to be as offensive to the Western palate as possible. Hi, and the starter is crickets. So you don't eat the wing. You hold the wing, make sure that the abdomen kind of pops up between your fingers, and you just pop the whole thing in your mouth, remove the wings with your teeth. Bite them off until the wings are left in your hand. With the leg? Yep. Whole thing. Salty. You have to eat the head and everything. You just ate the, the abdomen. <laughs> I like that. I like that one. Yeah, I like that one. OK, we've proved that a Westerner can eat an insect without throwing up. But are they any good for you? Wait for weight. They have at least the same amount of protein of beef, if not more. What's more important, too, is the quality of the protein. So it has all the amino acids that are lacking in other foods. So just by eating crickets, you're going to have a complete source of protein. The other big advantage of eating crickets is their efficiency. Although some people eat a lot of them, cows are actually really bad at converting grass into meat. For every kilo of cow you eat, the cow has had to eat 10 kilos of grass. Your average bug manages to convert 50% of what it eats to protein. All pretty impressive. But if you really want to get into the Protein Super League, you're going to have to stomach the bamboo worm. Weight for weight, it's more than double the protein of beef. And they're pretty popular in some cultures. But will any manage to get as far as a Western gullet? Fantastic. But remember, these are extreme gastronauts we're looking at here. Nutters who know no taste fear. The chances of your average Western lard ass giving up the burgers are slim. Well, not according to Patrick. Think about how we've evolved in terms of our taste according to our culture. Ten years ago, we would have been disgusted with the thought of eating raw fish. The man's got a point. In the UK alone, $25 million worth of Japanese food is consumed in restaurants each year, much of it in the form of sushi. So what are the chances of worms being the next big thing? The look is definitely what sets you off, but the taste of it is definitely good. So if, if it wasn't so, <laughs> I, I don't know, scary. <laughs> once you, once you overcome the, the first back, fear, yeah, yeah <laughs> then, you're, then you're OK, it's fine. Whatever they may think, we all might have to get used to eating creepy crawlies in the future. What we will be facing is a protein crisis. I mean, beef is taking up a lot of the Earth's resources, right? We have to clear up a lot of forests to make way for cattle. Insects and worms, on the other hand, can thrive in diverse ecosystems, producing proteins and other nutrients far more efficiently than those cud-chewing monsters. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, but perhaps it's the worm inside that's actually the reason. Before we leave you, we'll be meeting the saviour of the not-so-common dormouse. 
and tracking down one of the reasons for its demise. But first, let's go camping, test department style. Are you getting bored of lighting a fire using a match? Well, here's a more interesting way, because we're going to be lighting a fire with a tin can and a bar of chocolate. So how's it done? Well, first, you break up a piece of the chocolate. And of course, you need to test if it really is chocolate. Then use what's left to polish the bottom of the aluminium can. It takes a while, but in about 20 minutes, you can turn the can into a pretty good mirror. Now all you have to do is focus the sunlight onto some tinder wood, and with a bit of patience, you'll get a roasting hot fire going. OK. So it's not as quick as a match, but it's a much more satisfying way of getting your buns toasted. Experimental has travelled down to Dorset in the southwest of England in search of one of Britain's most important indigenous mammals. No, not llamas, they're from Peru. No, we're after a beast so rare that few ever get to see one. And, well, nor did we. Luckily, we're just down the road from Paynton Zoo. It's full of common species, elephants, zebras, and all those run-of-the-mill type animals. But hidden deep within, under the watchful eye of Julian Chapman, head mammal keeper, they've got what we've been looking for the finest example of his species, known as Big Daddy. And here he is, Muscadinus avellanarius, better known as the common dormouse, or perhaps more correctly, the exceedingly rare dormouse. What's happened with the dormice is, um, over the years since, for example, the Second World War, probably about 60% of uh, woodlands been felled, and ridiculously large amount of hedgerows have disappeared. And these were the places that the, the uh, dormice lived in. The zoo, along with many others, is trying to reintroduce the dormouse, partly for its own sake, and partly as an indicator of the health of the wider ecology. Happy dormice mean happy plants, insects, and birds. By using the dormice, which everybody thinks is cute and cuddly and very friendly, <clears throat> and they are, and they are important uh, as a species, but by doing, using those, we then save the whole woodland and the whole of the uh, hedgerows, which have really been hammered since the Second World War. The idea is to use Big Daddy as a stud to produce as many baby uber dormice as possible, which will be released into the wild and monitored over the coming years. So let's see if he can cut the mustard. Well, this is uh, the daddy's mate. He's about to put them together and hopefully They'll get on well, and we shall, uh, after that, we shall just lead them to it, I think. Hello. Ah, oh. well, let's face it, they have only just met, and there are cameras about. But with luck, this marriage will produce dozens of dormice ready for release. But before they go, each will be fitted with a microchip to aid tracking. So a little bleep will tell you exactly where they are, even if you can't see them. Armed with a receiver, Experimental headed into the Dorset countryside once more. Sure enough, we soon had a bleep. At last, the chance to see one of Britain's rarest mammals in its natural environment. Ah, oh, perhaps not. Sadly, it seems that the mouse we were tracking is one of the 275 million creatures that end up inside the gut of domestic cats each year. 